Um, so as was uh, mentioned, so I'm, actually, so I'm a primary care physician by training. Um, I also did an HIV fellowship uh, with Carrie um, at, um, with, with the HIV Clinical Scholars Program at the AIDS Institute. So I was at Harlem Hospital during that time and actually came to some of the rounds here. Um, and then also, I'm a researcher, so I spent the last five, six years working at Montefiore Medical Center um, conducting uh, HIV-related um, research. And then five months ago, transitioned to the health department, um, where, as was mentioned, I'm assistant commissioner for the Bureau of HIV. So what I'm going to be doing is presenting some of my research that I've done, and then also, like, depending on time, also touch on uh, some of the work that we're doing at the Bureau of HIV as it relates um, to women. And just to say that um, some of the data I'm talking about will refer specifically to uh, cisgender women, and then some of the data will refer to cisgender women and women of trans experience, but I'll try to um, specify that um, as we're going along. So I'll first talk about some of the research projects um, that I've done focused on PrEP and women and just sort of give a little bit background. Um, so at Montefiore, as I mentioned, I did my residency um, there in the primary care social medicine program and returned there in um, 2012 to be research faculty. Um, and that was around the time that uh, Truvada um, was approved for PrEP and got to be part of a really exciting program called Engage NYC that my colleague um, Baraj Patel and Dr. Rob Beal um, started at our clinic where they used um, sort of advertisements on dating websites um, about PrEP and primary care to engage um, young black and Latino MSM in PrEP care and primary care overall. And so that was a really exciting project to be, a program to be part of, um, seeing young men coming in. Sometimes people came in just for PrEP and we'd find they also had undiagnosed high blood pressure. And so it really, really highlighted the ways in which PrEP could also be a gateway drug, as they say, to primary care, which is great. Um, but as I was um, seeing patients, I noticed that we weren't seeing um, many women coming in um, asking about PrEP, who were on PrEP. And so, um, so we started thinking about, hmm, what are the opportunities here um, to engage women around PrEP? So I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to share some of the data in terms of New York City around PrEP, um, around women and HIV diagnoses, and then go back to some of my, the projects that I've done. So this is just to show you that new HIV diagnoses um, by gender, um, the way that new, the health department categorizes, male includes both um, cisgender men and trans men, and then female includes both cis and trans women. And as you can see, overall, there have been declines from 2012 to 2016. Um, women account for, in 2016, 22% of new HIV diagnoses, and about 20% um, of women who were diagnosed with HIV also were diagnosed with a concurrent AIDS diagnosis at the time. Um, and so even though the, the, the um, overall trend has been that of a decline, from 2015 to 2016, we did see um, a 5% increase in the number of new diagnoses among women. Um, and that is, we don't really know actually if that's the start of a trend or just a year-to-year -year, um, fluctuation. So once we get 2017 data all together, which will be the end of this year, we'll be able to see where, that, where that's going. And in terms of, um, when we think of um, HIV among women, it predominantly affects, we see actually the greatest disparities. Um, so about more than 90% of women who are diagnosed with HIV in New York City or are black or Latina. Um, and that's also even greater disparity among women of, of trans experience um, as well. So you can see the, the light color where it says female, that's black, and then 31% um, Latino, so more than 90%. And then this is looking at HIV diagnoses by gender and transmission risk. And you can see um, on your left-hand side, for women, about 63% of diagnoses are attributed to heterosexual contact, 26% um, um, unknown. But you can see sort of by and large, heterosexual contact is the primary mode of HIV acquisition for women. And this also just shows HIV diagnoses in women by age. So for cisgender women, we primarily see um, those affected by HIV who are being diagnosed 30 to 59, so tends to skew a little older. And for women of trans experience, it's a younger group, about 20 um, to 29 years old. So um, at the health department, we've also looked at awareness about PrEP, um, and this is, focuses on um, cisgender women. There's a survey that we do every year called the Sexual Health Survey, and um, this survey asks about PrEP awareness. 
Um, and in 2016, when it was done among about 400 participants, about a quarter had ever heard um, of PrEP. Um, awareness was associated with those who were younger, those who were born in the United States, those with a higher educational level and higher income. And then in multivariable analysis, um, awareness was significantly um, associated with women with um, uh, awareness, what was lower among women um, with lower incomes. Among the sample, 13% had an indication for PrEP, whether we're looking at both um, national guidance or New York State guidelines. And then of those who had heard of PrEP, uh, of those 97, 13% um, had ever discussed it with a provider. The majority had not discussed with a provider, but felt comfortable doing so, so reflecting really sort of openness um, among women to talk about PrEP with their providers. 39% did not believe or were not sure whether PrEP was effective, and this is something that has come up, um, and about 19% were interested in PrEP. And of the 400 women in the sample, only um, two had reported um, ever using PrEP. And when we look at awareness, so it was 25% in the sample, um, we look at um, MSM, the rates of awareness are uh, greater than 90%, so really big differences. This is also data from our um, primary care information project, which looks at 600 um, primary care practices around the city and looks at tr trends in prescriptions. And so this shows um, in the red are PrEP prescriptions from 2014 to 2016 um, that are going um, to men. And so these are like kind of big buckets. We don't know sort of where um, people with trans experience would fit into some of these buckets. The lighter color um, reflects the trend for women. And as you can see, really the increase overall in the gray line is really driven almost 100% by the increase in PrEP prescriptions um, to men with prescriptions to women remaining um, increasing but like but relatively stable. So I, as I was um, seeing patients um, and really thinking about PrEP as it relates to women, I started um, collaborating with some, community, with some of my community partners um, and so wrote a, a few different uh, pieces around uh, sort of raising the alarm about women don't, don't know about PrEP. And so with Kim, Kimberly Smith, who works at Cal and Lord, who's head of policy there, we wrote an article for a website called For Harriet. There's a new pill to revolutionize black women's sexual health. Um, and we got really some interesting comments back um, from, um, from um, people who were checking out the website, which we later, and I'll talk about we later, um, actually did content analysis of the comments. Um, to see sort of what were the main themes that were coming up. Um, and then also for uh, a local um, blog also did a, an op-ed with Planned Parenthood. So I wasn't funded to do this research. I was funded to do other work. So I basically tried to figure out like how could I do prep for women related work um, without having funding. And so as I mentioned, um, this leveraging social media to explore black women's perspective on um, on PrEP um, was related to looking at a content analysis of the comments um, to this article that were written on Facebook. And um, there are many comments that women had, but a lot of them really, mistrust was a huge part of this actually. A lot of women were really sort of worried about the safety overall of PrEP, but also the effects it could have on their reproductive health and health in general, which was interesting. I think really highlighted the importance when we, as provide, clinical providers, really when we, or even as non-clinical providers, when we talk to patients, maybe even preemptively really sort of highlighting what we know about the safety of these medications, how they've been used in people living with HIV, you know, since 2004, and things like that. Um, I also did um, a chart review with colleagues at um, the Oval Center, which I'll talk about briefly. It's our comprehensive sexual health clinic at, at Montefiore, where we looked at, um, you know, which women are receiving PrEP and are they coming back? And so I'm going to talk briefly about um, some of that work. So as I mentioned, the Oval Center, it um, provides STI screening and treatment, um, PrEP and PEP as well, and it offers a sliding fee scale for those who um, are uninsured. So we did a review looking at from December 2014 when the center opened to August 2016 to look at the number of, um, and this is cisgender women, who received care um, at the clinic to find out how many had received at least one PrEP prescription. And so of 550 women, only 21 had received a PrEP prescription, so about 4% of the women seen. And this is like a sexual health clinic where all of the providers had received education about PrEP. Um, the medical director, has, um, Sachin Jane, who's now at the health department, had done a lot of work around PrEP, and still we were seeing like women weren't really being prescribed um, PrEP. And then when we looked at the 21 women, um, the median age was um, 35. They were primarily um, black and Latina, which is representative um, of the epidemic, um, including in the Bronx. And most women um, had insurance. 
Um, when we looked at the reasons why women were taking PrEP, um, most of the women reported it was because they were in a serodiscordant, this, this is all based on chart review, so being in a serodiscordant relationship with a male partner was the most common reason. Um, of those, um, most of the women reported that their partners were on antiretrovirals, and of those, many reported that their partners had undetectable viral load. Um, and then there were a few women who had a male partner who had other concurrent relationships, and one woman reported having a partner um, one woman reported having multiple male partners. So it was really, really getting at sort of the low-hanging fruit, like the women who knew they had a partner who was living with HIV, most of whom were on medication. And so really thinking about, you know, other women in other sort of risk contexts um, who might benefit um, from PrEP. And then we also looked at um, whether women came back, and about 60% uh, of women who, who received a PrEP prescription came back in three months, and about a third came back. Um, in six months. And again, we don't really know, um, you know the goal, there's no gold standard for in terms of retention in PrEP care because, you know, think risk is dynamic and things change. But, you know, presumably many of these women were in long-term monogamous, um, relation, exclusively monogamous relationships with their HIV positive male partners. So, so presumably things might not have changed, but maybe they were sort of doing a calculation in their head. Maybe I don't really need this. We're, so we ended up actually doing some, um, some qualitative work to understand you know, women's pathways to PrEP. Um, how did they, how did they sort of, whatever the barriers they faced to ultimately come and get the prescription at the Opal Center for PrEP. And we asked, you know, them, you know, how they found out about PrEP. Many found out about it from a partner, um, from their HIV positive partner, um, who learned about it from their um, HIV care provider. Um, some women found out it from a pamphlet. Other, someone remarked, I think Charlie Sheen's, uh, <laughs> One of his partners was on a talk show, I think on Dr. Oz, and had talked about how she didn't get HIV when she was with him. She was on PrEP, and so this really resonated with people. Um, we asked about PrEP indication, again, for this qualitative study. Most of the women, again, were in serodiscordant um, partnerships. Um, and then we asked about a number of different aspects of their pathways to PrEP, which I don't know if I have time necessarily to go into. But um, all this to say is that most of the women have insurance. Um, most of the women were able to get Metro cards to go to the clinic. People had really positive experiences at the clinic with the providers. The clinic where it's located is very discreetly located. Um, there's not a lot of um, foot traffic. And so all of these things sort of work to sort of promote their ability to be linked uh, to um, PrEP care. I, we also looked at some of the barriers that women mentioned. So even though women got a prescription, not all of the women actually started the medication. And so concerns about safety and side effects came up a lot. So this is um, one woman who said, I Googled PrEP as everybody probably does. I was mostly worried because I wanted to see what kind of side effects there were because I already had depression and one of the side effects was depression. I didn't want to add on to my depression because I already can't deal with the depression I have. And this was someone who received a prescription but didn't ultimately um, start PrEP. Um, this is um, another quote. Um, this is a woman who actually was um, breastfeeding, but I didn't take the PrEP because I know it can stream through the breast milk and it can harm her. It's like a heavy duty drug. The first time I was like, do I really need to take it? It's a heavy hitter on the organs, so I've got to go through all this testing. Maybe I don't really need it. Then my test came back negative, I think it's her HIV test, and I was like, maybe I don't need it. So there are just a, a lot of sort of weighing back and forth that women are doing about whether this is like worthwhile taking or not. Um, we also found that a number of women had providers who just were telling them really incorrect false statements about PrEP, which tended to discourage women from taking it. So this woman, um, this is the one who was actually was breastfeeding, said, the second time I went to City MD, the doctor there, she was asking me, are you breastfeeding? I said, yes. She said, I can't prescribe this to you if you're going to still breastfeed your child. She kept saying, if you're not sure you're going to be able to stop breastfeeding, I can't give this to you because we don't have studies to show this won't harm your child. And, you know, and this is not really accurate. I mean, we don't have studies in women who are taking PrEP, but we have a lot of um, retrospective data in women who are living with HIV who've taken these medications. We also have data registry information to see whether there are associations between this medication and um, birth defects among children, and we have not yet found any um, significant associations. Um, and then the, the person also said, she, she's like, let me explain to you, this is something that usually gay men take. Based on what you explained to me, you don't seem like you have too much to be worried about. So these are women who are like already like, are like I don't know if this is for me, and then like providers are, are saying this, so very discouraging. And then lastly, um, stigma. Um, 
So we found there's a great deal of stigma around PrEP um, because for a number of reasons. For this woman, she talked about picking up her medication at the pharmacy. If a pharmacy does say it out loud, you need PrEP. So the, apparently the pharmacist said the name of the medication. She felt like out loud so people could hear. You need to quit going to that pharmacy. PrEP is supposed to be something that's completely private. In fact, they're not even supposed to hand you your medicine. They're supposed to put it in a bag. So when I went to the pharmacy and they personally wanted to hand me the med, that's a problem. So it's just like at all these, <laughs> at all these stages, women are experiencing um, potential barriers to, to starting medication. Um, one woman talked about how she called the insurance company to see if she had coverage. And the person on the phone was like, well, why do you need this? And she said that when her, her partner was positive and the person on the phone at the insurance company asked her, well, why would you have a sexual partner who's HIV positive? So there's just, there's just a, a lot, <laughs> like a lot going on here. So we, we kind of came up with this idea um, this concept of like prep rumination, um, but it's of thoughts, cognitive processes, deliberations about prep where women are weighing the, the benefits and risks. Uh, and it's usually associated with a skepticism and typically a delay in starting PrEP or not starting PrEP. Um, so this is one woman who, who didn't end up starting. It's just the side effects of PrEP that I'm worried about. I have to make another appointment. They made me an appointment, but I didn't start, so there was no reason to come. So there were a lot of women who like got a prescription, but like didn't end up actually starting their medication because of all these other barriers. Okay, so just from doing some of this work um, and looking at the fact that we were finding a lot of women who were in serodiscordant um, partnerships, and I was interested in women who, who had other sort of behaviors that might place them at risk or other risk contexts. Um, I um, embarked on a study where we developed a prep peer navigation and outreach intervention. Um, and we did this work, um, it focused on women of trans experience and cis women with New York harm reduction educators, um, NIRI, um, who are located in East Harlem in the Bronx. And so um, they provide harm reduction services um, and specifically mobile syringe exchange. So their sites, they have about nine sites throughout Harlem and the South Bronx where they have like vans like that or there'll be people with two large like duffel bags where um, you can get um, clean syringes, you can return old syringes, HIV testing, condoms, etc. And so um, this organization primarily provides services to people who are involved in um, the sex trade um, and or who are injecting drugs. So we're really interested in talking about PrEP with women who we would encounter here. Um, so as I mentioned, we just basically embedded the work that we were doing into their peer-delivered services. So they use peers anyway to deliver information about harm reduction to do syringe exchange. So we said, well, why don't we just do the same thing but um, provide education around PrEP um, and counseling around PrEP and then also referral to PrEP care if women were interested. So we had um, two, two peers, one who was a cisgender woman, one who's a woman of trans experience. Um, they received training in harm reduction, prep education counseling um, through the New York City Health Department's um, training, and then also with linkage to prep um, and navigation, and then training in motivational interviewing too. And so the components of this intervention that we developed include some, some brief education about prep, like what is prep, how does it work, what doesn't it do, what are some of the side effects, and how you take it. Um, there was also a counseling component which used, was sort of in the spirit of motivational interviewing and sort of worked with people to identify pros and cons about taking PrEP. And then the peers um, were um, available to provide reminders, accompany women to appointments, um, help with scheduling, and then we also provided uh, metro cards um, to PrEP appointments at a local clinic. Um, and so we recruited women, as I mentioned, at these uh, nine mobile syringe exchange sites. Um, NIRI, the organization we worked as, with, is also affiliated, it's actually part of Washington Heights Corner Project, which, um, which has a, a drop-in center for women who are involved in sex work. So they usually, Friday nights, will go there, get food, hang out before they um, go out to work. So we recruited women there as well. We had really broad eligibility criteria because of where we were recruiting. Um, we also didn't want women to feel like they couldn't be forthcoming about their HIV status or their behavior. Um, so you just have to be a self-identified woman who was proficient in English and 18 years or older. We also enrolled HIV positive women and linked them to the program's HIV care and navigation peer services. Um, so we passed out this flyer at the different syringe exchange sites. Um, would you like to be connected to care and services you need? Um, so for the initial, um, and I'll talk about the flow of the, the study, but for the initial encounter which involved um, doing a, completing a questionnaire and receiving education and counseling about PrEP, we offered a $40 gift card and then um, for a subsequent follow-up survey, um, $25.
And so we just were at these sites, the same sites every week, so women knew we were there and they could come um, to be recruited. So in terms of the flow of our intervention, um, so our peers did outreach, again, at these mobile syringe exchange sites in the drop-in center. Everything was done on an iPad, so we did e-consent. We conducted a baseline survey that asked about sociodemographic characteristics, sexual and drug use behaviors, PrEP awareness, HIV beliefs and attitudes. And then once the women completed the survey, the peer delivered about 10 minutes of education and counseling about PrEP. And then the peer would then say, you know, are you interested in PrEP? Are you interested in learning more? Would you like an appointment? And so we would offer um, an appointment at a nearby, one, the nearby clinic. Um, and if it was during the hours the clinic was open, we'd get on the phone with our PrEP navigator at the clinic to give the person, um, the, the participant, their date and time of their appointment. If it was after hours, the PrEP navigator would call the women um, the next morning with the appointment um, and day and time. Um, and then the peers would provide assistance with attending the first few appointments. Um, and then I should also say that we um, also didn't just offer referral to the clinic to, for PrEP only. So if women needed OB-GYN care, general primary care, if they needed housing, we provided referral mental health. We would walk women actually to Nairi if people needed social work referrals. So we were also trying to address you know, a lot of the other social and structural barriers um, that women were facing. And then ultimately, we hoped that they got to the clinic um, and saw a provider um, to be evaluated for PrEP. Um, so as I mentioned, we did surveys at baseline during that initial encounter, and then four to 12 weeks later. Um, and then we also did um, qualitative interviews um, at follow-up with the participants, the CBO staff, and with our peers. And I'll just talk about um, the follow-up interviews with the peers. And then this is some of our analysis. And then so we ended up over probably a three-month period recruiting 64 women. Um, so this is just a pilot study in terms of assessing um, feasibility and um, acceptability. And so sort of a range of ages, um, about a quarter of the women were women of um, trans experience. Most of the women were um, black and Latina, sort of reflective of the demographics um, in the Bronx. Um, most, many of the women um, considered themselves to be straight, although a third uh, or quarter um, considered themselves bisexual. And then in terms of um, partnership status, about a third re reported being partnered. Um, the vast majority reported being um, unemployed, and about a third had less than a high school um, diploma or GED equivalent. Um, half were housing insecure, um, and the majority had health insurance. So I, th I think we talk about, I was talking to Dr. Wingood earlier, you know, a lot of people like have, you know, insurance, it's not the issue, it's all the other, you know, barriers that get in the way of people actually being able to access um, care. What is housing insecure? Oh, so we, add, so we actually ended up dichotomizing, we asked about like being double, so basically they didn't have their own apartment, we considered them housing care, like they were doubled up, sleeping at someone else's place, sleeping in some other street location, we considered that housing insecure. Um, about so about 12% of the women that we recruited were um, HIV positive, and so we ended up referring um, those women to um, the HIV peer navigator. Um, everyone refused. <laughs> everyone said they actually had their own providers um, and that they didn't need um, our assistance. Um, whether they were like engaged in care at that time was a, another issue, but most, many people do have providers that they, they recognize as their primary provider. Um, about three quarters of the women were sexually active, a third reported engaging in exchange sex, and about a quarter reported um, injecting drugs. Um, in terms of PrEP awareness, about half um, reported hearing about having heard of PrEP, and a third said they'd asked their healthcare provider about PrEP. We tried to distinguish between like post exposure because I think there may have been some confusion between like post exposure prophylaxis and pre exposure prophylaxis. So we were very clear. We clearly defined what they were for the women. Um, I have to say, some women were intoxicated, you know, when they were interviewed, and there are a lot of things that might have limited people's understanding of what we were asking. Um, but this, so a third um, said they had asked their healthcare provider about PrEP. 45% um, of the women who were aware had a healthcare provider talk to them about PrEP. Um, about six women reported having been prescribed PrEP. One said that she had, was still on PrEP at the time that she was interviewed. And about half said they knew someone who was um, taking PrEP. 
Um, in terms of HIV-related worry, we, this is another uh, measure that we dichotomized, but about half of the women reported a high level of HIV worry about HIV, sort of thinking about it often, but only 25% um, considered themselves necessarily at high risk um, for HIV. And so this is our PrEP care continuum for this project. So we, of the 52 HIV-negative women who received the intervention, um, 38 expressed interest in PrEP. Um, 27, or half of the women, accepted a PrEP appointment. And then we had a steep drop between women who accepted the appointment and then those who um, actually ended up, at, had a scheduled appointment and then scheduled an appointment. So basically getting women to the clinic was the, the challenge. Um, and so we did some qualitative work to understand what are the barriers to actually getting women in the door for um, an appointment. So the housing insecurity was a big one. Some women were living in a shelter. So it was basically, basically competing, competing priorities. There were a lot of other things that women were, uh, were focused on, having life crises, um, family obligations, so a lot of caregiving. Women had a lot of other appointments. Some were mandated, some were healthcare related, a lot of other health concerns, including substance use, mental health, all of these acted to um, um, impede women's ability to come for appointments. And so this is one quote. Um, again, it, there's, this is a woman who didn't make her appointment. Again, it's just so much going on in my life. All these doctor's appointments that I have going on, I go to physical therapy, then I have to go take care of my son. I still got to take care of the house. I still got to work. So it's just not the top, it's not on the top of the list. And then this is a woman who was homeless about saying why she missed the appointment. Because of being homeless and using drugs, you either forget or you get a don't care attitude. But me, I forgot totally. And so we had a really hard time getting in touch with many of the women. Many of the women actually um, did not have working phones. And so we would hope that women would come back, sort of knowing we were at the different sites, would come back to engage us. Um, and we were able to, get, to actually follow up with a, about 38 of the 52 um, women um, for qualitative interviews. But getting in touch with people was a challenge. And so obviously people, we couldn't remind people of appointments because we couldn't get in touch with them. Oh, and so these are just some conclusions. Um, so we were able to definitely recruit women over a three-month period, working a few days a week. We were able to get a good number of women um, recruited to our study and to, to learn about PrEP. But, you know, as I said, we said, the majority reported interest, but only a minority actually made it to their appointment, and then competing barriers were a big part of this. And so even though we were trying to take care of some of the other social and structural issues, I mean, I think a lot of this <laughs> needs to, like, happen maybe probably beforehand in terms of, um, being helpful for women in terms of stabilizing their lives before they can really consider PrEP. So I don't know, we were just maybe too early. And I think our approach would have been like, what, are, what, do, you, what do you need? What do you care about? Addressing those things and then being like, oh, and by the way, there's this thing called PrEP. Have you heard about it? <laughs> As opposed to like PrEP being the first thing that we talk about with women. We also wondered whether just the delay from the time we offered appointment to the scheduled appointment usually was one to two weeks, whether that might have played a role. And so if we could have taken women like that day to the doctor or the clinical provider, whether that might have made a difference. And then I also have um, written grants related to this, but like pro prescribing um, on-site prep, um, so in the mobile van, so doing STI testing on the van, giving folks a seven-day supply or the 30-month supply of prep, really sort of bringing the care to women and not expecting women to have to come to a clinic that might not be convenient for them. Okay, so I'm going to like, I, I don't know how much more time I have. I have some more time. Okay, I'm going to briefly touch on for the Bureau of HIV, so my new role, um, some of the initiatives that we're working on as they relate to PrEP and women. Um, and so firstly, um, we had a, a, a social marketing campaign. I don't know if, if anyone, did anyone see picture the social marketing? <laughs> getting some nods. Um, so, you know, some other jurisdictions, I think D.C., which is the prep for her dominate, where all the women are in white at the top, um, I think that was the only jurisdiction that did a, a specific prep for women, and this is for cis women. They're actually now doing one for um, women of trans experience. Um, and these are just some other campaigns that some of our community partners have done um, focused on women, but we felt that um, we were hearing a lot from the, our community partners that there was a need to do a specific campaign that targeted, um, that targeted women. So we did some formative work actually that I was actually part of before I joined um, the health department. I was like one of the participants. And we found that um, women felt the marketing campaign should raise awareness about PrEP, because remember there was that 24% of women, of cisgender women knew about PrEP. Um, most don't know what it is, and if they do know about it, they think or are told that it's exclusively, exclusively for men who have sex with men. Um, 
women felt like the campaign model should be diverse and should look like them, should have a range of race, ethnicities, body shapes, ages. Um, women were very clear, even though we know HIV disproportionately targets black and Latina women, they did not want to, want to just see black and Latina women. It was really important to see a range of women so that black and Latina women were not being stigmatized. Sex positivity was something that was very desirable. And then for women of trans experience, in our group, they felt like it was really important to be portrayed alongside um, cisgender women and that our um, advertising addressed potential interactions of PrEP with hormone therapy. And so these are some of the um, images that were around the city. And they were also in English and Spanish. So the name of the campaign is Living Shore. Um, and so in all these different locations, and I think just, just finished wrapping up. Um, and these are just some sightings from actual train stations. Okay, and so what we're doing now in terms of this campaign, we're developing some palm cards that we hope to distribute to our community partners and also clinical sites that have sort of similar imaging and messaging, and really the call to action is for women to talk with their providers um, about PrEP. We're also printing posters for distribution, which um, we're hoping to actually put up in WIC offices um, throughout the city and actually the rest of the state. So we're working with women, infant, and child um, offices um, to get um, the posters there. We feel like that's a really unique opportunity to raise awareness about PrEP. And then off, off also having an online repository, because a lot of our community partners want to download the images for their, for their work that they're doing. Okay. Then I'm going to talk very briefly about PrEP implementation in our PlaySure network. Have folks heard of the PlaySure network? It's a collaborative of both clinical and non-clinical. I think we have some representatives. <laughs> Columbia, I think, is a, yeah, is a member of the PlaySure network. And so it's basically this um, robust collaborative or network of um, providers who are working together um, to increase um, sort of navigation and linkage to um, PrEP and PEP. So we have HIV testing sites that um, do testing um, and link to um, PrEP and PEP clinics, community-based organizations that also help to deal with some of the uh, issues around social determinants of health and also with linkage to our PrEP clinics. We have them throughout the city. Those are all the different dots for our different place your network sites. And so I was interested in understanding um, for cis women um, what the experience was for some of our um, place your network partners who were being, who was being enrolled. So of 5,400 new enrollments that we had at our different PlaySure network sites um, from April to December of last year, um, about 12% were among cisgender women um, who have sex with men. Um, most of the women were Latina, black and Latina, and we sort of had a range um, of ages. We had enrollments sort of split between community-based sites um, as well as clinical sites. Um, and we found that about 12% of women at non-clinical sites were linked to PrEP, and about 34% of women who were enrolled at clinical sites um, were prescribed um, PrEP. So I was interested because like, women account for about 22% of new diagnoses, um, cisgender women, and so we're just seeing like, a lower number of enrollments in our place your network and trying to understand why that might be the case. Um, so we actually asked some of our place your network providers what strategies they're using to engage women. Um, at some of the non-clinical um, community-based sites, um, partners mentioned utilizing women staff members to help make personal connections with clients, sort of like building trust. Um, a lot, of, and I've talked, I've spoke with colleagues in other parts of the country about this too, but also having this sort of prep universal prep education approach. Like we don't know which women, it's a little bit more challenging to identify which women will benefit from PrEP. So really talking to PrEP about to all women and integrating it into everything. So there's a breastfeeding group, they talk about PrEP. There's like a Debbie that's being run, they integrate PrEP into that. So really women are getting this information in many different ways. Um, when women are coming in for supportive services, providing information about PrEP then as well. Um, also just scheduling PrEP appointments when women are there, and I think actually linking them to appointments uh, makes sense. And then some partners are talk to women about, you know, this sort of the epidemiology of, of um, HIV, about, um, you know, in terms of black and Latino women being disproportionately impacted, et cetera, et cetera, sort of hoping to heighten um, interest in PrEP. At our clinical sites, they find that women are coming in because they're interested in STI testing, not necessarily HIV testing but using that as an opportunity to talk to women about healthy sex lives and PrEP. Um, 
And then also allowing for several conversations to change women's perceptions towards PrEP. I think sort of related to this like PrEP rumination thing, I think, you know, for for some folks, it may be a slam dunk, like I'm gonna start PrEP today, but for, for women in particular, it may be like talking about this like multiple, multiple times before women are really on board and then realizing that. Um, again, utilizing women staff members and then leveraging relationships with clinical providers. So HIV primary care clinics, um, staff um, will help to refer HIV negative partners um, to some of the place your network sites and then also referring from family planning and gynecology departments. We're finding a lot of pushback among ob gyns about, um, <laughs> I don't wanna generalize, I'm sure there's some ob gyns that I know personally who are prescribing PrEP, but many just feel like it's just not in their wheelhouse. They're just like, this is another thing for me to do. Um, so we are trying to help um, ob gyns with referring women, although we know that's like another step and people can be lost. Um, but it's, I gave grand rounds at an institution, which I won't name, to ob gyns about PrEP, and one of the questions was, well, we don't really ask about sexual history. How would we <laughs> assess a woman for, for PrEP? And I was just like, I, if, if ob gyns aren't asking about sexual history, then I guess no, no one really, no one is. So it's really shocking. Okay, so just finishing up, um, we we're also doing outreach to providers about PrEP for Women. So last year and then at the beginning of our campaign um, in March, our PrEP for Women campaign, we resent out this Dear Colleague letter that was sort of highlighting again um, CDC and New York State guidance for its indications for PrEP, but also highlighting the link um, between HIV risk and intimate partner violence. So women who are experiencing IPV to really think about talking about PrEP with women and offering it. Um, clearly partners with a detectable viral load and women who are involved in exchange sex. And then just in terms of the epidemiology of um, sort of STIs and HIV in New York City, um, we have data that shows that women who are diagnosed with gonorrhea and early syphilis have a very high risk of acquiring HIV subsequently. So we think if women are diagnosed with those, that they should know about PrEP and be offered PrEP um, immediately. Um, and then lastly, because we know that risk is really about larger structural factors, particularly for women and less about individual risk behaviors, um, we did highlight that women who are living in, black and Latina women who live in high poverty areas um, that be aware of PrEP and know about PrEP um, as an option. So lastly, we are doing a public, public health detailing, um, which is a model that the pharmaceutical industry has used to really um, sell um, Met new medications, but we're using the model to deliver um, short, standardized, evidence-based messages um, about PrEP. Um, and so we've done uh, four rounds of this, around PrEP and PEP specifically, and um, I'm gonna talk about, we're gonna be launching a round specifically for women's health providers who are providing care in areas where there's a high HIV diagnosis rate. Um, and the key messages really are to take a thorough sexual history, to screen and treat for STIs, to talk about PrEP with your patients and PEP, and then how to prescribe, or if you feel uncomfortable, how to refer patients. So this just shows the different sites where in the past we have reached providers, over 5,000 clinical staff and 2,500 providers in the last four waves. Um, so we did do some formative research to understand from women's health providers, and this is providers for cisgender women, um, so OB-GYNs, um, midwives and family planning providers. Um, and we found that most of the providers did not routinely ask about partner HIV status as part of their sexual history taking. A minority of the providers were familiar with PrEP and PEP or felt comfortable offering it to patients. They wanted more evidence, particularly around like the safety of PrEP and um, conception and pregnancy and breastfeeding, and were concerned again about um, payment insurance coverage. Um, so we made sure to address some of these in our new updated action kit, which will focus on women's health providers. So um, we also, so safety has been put into that IPV screening and then the role of partner and contextual factors in women's risk of HIV. We also have a self screener that women can use to figure out whether PrEP is for them. And then we, our kit tended to have a lot of images of men. So we have more images of, of women in the kit and that'll be starting hopefully in August or September. So, sorry, I know I ran through that pretty quickly. Um, so we're, you know, I think some of the research that I talked about showed some of the challenges um, that women face in terms of like actually getting into PrEP care and then when they're taking PrEP, so the stigma, a lot of women are not talking, who are on PrEP don't talk about it with anybody. And we know that women um, like to hear things from their friends and from women who are like them. So 
Um, one of the things that we're trying to do actually is potentially do testimonials of women who are, who are using PrEP um, so to talk about their experiences, which we think is really important. Um, and then talking about um, our Bureau of HIV initiatives, really raising awareness around PrEP among women as well as providers. So this is a quote from one of my community partners and friends, Kimberly Smith, that PrEP may not be for every woman, um, but it's an option for all women. And so we really want to make sure that all women are at least are aware of it and have access to it and that we're able to support them um, in, in taking it. So I think that is it. Yeah. Okay, I know that was long. Okay, great. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for a very, yes. very interesting uh, presentation. I wonder whether you are aware of uh, the program which is called On Track New York, which, and this might be relevant. This is for uh, where New York State has taken a lead on keeping uh, people on track mm -hmm. for who had first breaks of schizophrenia. And okay. rather oh. than having them, you know, in the hospital and getting lost, mm. they use, and that might be relevant, a buddy system. Okay. So a buddy system of somebody mm -hmm. who had that history, mm -hmm. who overcame that or stays on medication, and who then has, you know, one-on-one -on -one a buddy system like yeah. that. Yeah. And I th was thinking that might be relevant here rather than all the messages, mm -hmm. which are important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But for people who are high risk, whom you want to keep, to get some of the women who are doing it really paired off yeah. uh, with them. And yes. if you have, you know, it's on track New York, uh, uh, New York State is a leader in that, and we have a big group here yeah. who, is, uh, who are doing it. So okay. that could also uh, oh, that's great. No, I think, and I really appreciate your comment. Um, I think, you know, in some of the studies in sub-Saharan Africa, so those are like the PrEP studies were conducted among cisgender women right. there. Um, you know, they found very low rates yeah. of adherence in some of the studies. Um, but in those studies in which the rates were much higher of adherence, it was often because um, the women reported that their partners, like, that were very supportive of them taking PrEP, and they would often take it with their HIV positive partner, but I just think it speaks to the point that um, of the support that's right. often needed um, for women in particular who have to deal with, you know, we have to deal with lots of other responsibilities exactly. and to have that. So I appreciate um, what you're saying. We've also thought about like doing support group, like support groups for women taking prep, <laughs> so that can, women can hear about other women's experiences. But I think um, like a one on one. Yes. With some of the people who had some yes. experiences. But yes. Yes. Yeah, and we'd hope with the peers that we recruited peers for our intervention who had, had, had were taking prep, right. but we weren't able to find women who were taking prep. But that was sort of part of the idea of someone yes. who like yes. has the experience uh, um, supporting the women. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you looked at birth control, like in the first two studies, if any of the women were also taking the pill, and didn't want to have to worry about taking a second pill every day. Or right. Yeah, so we did, I, we, we're still like analyzing our data from our intervention, um, and we, we did ask about birth control, but I don't have that just yet, but, I, but it's, a great, it's a great point. Um, yes, so this, is, this has come up a lot. I do have a colleague, Sarah Calabrese, who's at GW, who is looking at this, and I can, hopefully maybe if I can get your information, um, I can ask her what she's found in her sample. Her sample was women at Planned Parenthood of, of New England, but they were looking at sort of correlates of like, Women's interested in prep, interest in prep, and like what birth control methods they're taking. Um, yes, no, I think that's and, and you know there are multi-purpose technologies that are being that are in development, like rings that have like prep and contraceptive contraceptive hormones, blah blah blah. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm sorry I came in. That's fine. It's so exciting. I'm hoping to make some suggestions. Yes. That make you feel compelled to have more partners. Yes. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. Or um, a colleague in, in D.C. had talked with me about um, using telemedicine yeah, to build yeah. up a, like an ID doc mm -hmm. with personnel in the needles and be able to at yeah. least do the screening yeah. 